Hi there, I'm James Dapache, and this is Coffee and a Case Note. <laughs> Team, today we are going to talk about a purchaser and a vendor, but we're going to use the words plaintiff and defendant. So the plaintiff is going to be the vendor, they are the bunch of parties who sold something, the defendant is going to be the purchaser, they're the bunch of people who bought something, but we're going to treat them as if they're just one entity each. All right, we have got the sale of shares in a business that operate, operates an online retailing uh, venture enterprise, and what happens is our defendant buys our plaintiff's shares in that online retail enterprise and the purchase is made up of three different components. And before you get too bored, uh, this is going to get into some fiddly detail, but I promise it's going to be a worthwhile chat for us all. So what did the defendant pay to the plaintiff or what did the defendant have to pay to the plaintiff pursuant to the deed that they entered into together in relation to the sale of these shares? Well, there were three components to it. One component was $20 million, full stop, just that amount of money. The second component was some shares in the defendant. So the plaintiff ended up getting some shares in the defendant as a result of the purchase. And the third element was the earn out amount, the EOM um, that we're gonna speak about at some length today. So three elements of that purchase, 20 million, don't think about it again. Shares in the defendant, don't think about it again but this earn out amount we're gonna dive into a little bit. Now, the earn out amount is made up itself of two components. Right? One component is the base earn out amount, which is just the figure of $10 million flatly. And the additional earn out amount is the sum in excess of $10 million that is earned over this relevant financial year up to a cap of 15 million, right? And so our plaintiff, the person selling, the shares, wants it to be a nice high figure, wants it to earn a lot of money in this year after the sale in order for that earn out amount to be nice and high towards a cap of 5 million, which is to say up to 15 million uh, being the amount in excess of 10. If that makes sense, hopefully I'm explaining that properly. Um, and of course, what the purchaser would like is potentially for that earn out amount not to be all of that high, so they don't have to pay that additional amount. They've already paid 20 plus 10 plus shares um, if they can save another $5 million, there are, with great respect and without criticism of any parties, um, there's an incentive or, or certainly a financial uh, benefit to that being the case. And so the deed entered into between the relevant parties has a mechanism in relation to how are we going to figure out this earn out amount, this additional earn out amount. And the short point is, is we're going to have to figure out what the earnings are. That's going to determine the additional earn out amount. And so there's an argue, an argument about what are earnings. And the deed has this mechanism that says the defendant is going to send a profit and loss statement and an earnings statement over to the plaintiff, which is to say the purchaser is going to prepare all the figures, send it back to the vendor and say, these are the figures, this is what the earnings are. And based on that, the uh, vendor, the plaintiff for today is going to respond and say, hey, look, that's interesting, but you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, we've got some questions about this. Here's our counter suggestion and some contested matters. Then the parties would have to negotiate. The negotiation goes nowhere. They refer it off to an expert. And the deed has these various steps that the parties have to work through in order to get there in relation to the, uh, any dispute about the capital E earnings. You already know where we're going. Uh, so transaction happens, 30 million bucks, uh, transfer of shares isn't really mentioned in the judgment, but so let's just assume that's all dealt with fine. We're focusing on the earnings. And after the first year, the purchaser, which is to say today's defendant, sends through a profit and loss statement that says, sadly, uh, the earnings were 6 million. And so that's a lot less than 10 million. And so there's no further earn out amount. There's no additional earn out amount to be paid. And what the vendor, today's plaintiff, said in reply was, well, our maths suggest that it's about 15 million. And here are a number of contested matters. So we have this disagreement. There's then the good faith negotiation that's required by the deed. And then there is the referral off to the expert, uh, firstly, of just broadly, how are we going to figure out earnings? And secondly, more specifically, the vendors or today's plaintiffs contested matters. How are we going to deal with those? And that is the focus of today's case. 
What does the court say about how we're going to deal with this referral off to the expert in this contest between our plaintiff seller, plaintiff vendor, and our defendant purchaser? Well, the short point is uh, the court agrees with the plaintiff. Uh, the court says that um, earnings have to be determined in accordance with the deed, which is what the plaintiff vendor was after. There are these specific clauses in the deed that deal with this. So clause 2.1 and 2.2 essentially say, when you're thinking about earnings, you have to exclude all the share sale transaction type costs you might bump into. So there's costs about redundancies or restructures or related party transactions. These kind of costs that you'd say would not have been incurred by the business in the normal course of things, then you just exclude those when you're calculating earnings. And so the uh, one of the contested matters is that the defendant, the purchaser, failed to exclude those properly. Clause 2.3 says that earnings are to be calculated as if the business was being run the same way post-purchase as it had been run pre-purchase. And if there are any big changes, then the impact of those big changes that the defendant purchaser might make need to be normalized in order to calculate earnings. And as you might imagine, the difference between 6 million and 15 million, the two different sides of this argument, a number of the contested matters involve the plaintiff saying, well, uh, you need to comply with clauses 2.1, 2.2, 2.3 in the consideration of earnings. And in these contested matters, A, B, C, D, E, F, etc., you fail to do that. And so there are submissions made to the expert. And the contested matters, the types of them, um, there are three sort of broad categories the court turns its attention to. Firstly, our plaintiff our vendor says, hey, look, um, you failed to run the business uh, appropriately or the way it had been run because we had plans for implementing a new website and you didn't go ahead and implement that new website in the way we said you should and that we planned to. And so we shouldn't have to bear your uh, goof, your failure to implement what we said was a good idea. That shouldn't be calculated into earnings. That shouldn't reduce the number. And so the expert needs to account for that and needs to kind of surgically remove the impact of the purchases in the vendor's view, the purchaser's failure to adequately do that. A similar argument was raised in relation to the vendor's view that a third party logistics person, you know, this is an online retailer. So logistics, how are you gonna get the physical stuff from one location off to the next location? That's an important part of the plan in the vendor's view. And they say, oh, we had this good plan. Uh, we set it out for you. You should have gone ahead with it and you didn't. And so earnings shouldn't be reduced or earnings should be normalized on account of your change from that logistics plan. And then the third kind of limb of the contested matters raised by the vendor relates to marketing. And what the vendor says is all your marketing or, or too much of your marketing focused on sales, conversion, discounts, right? Direct transactional stuff. Whereas what you really should have been focusing on is branding, brand awareness, broader, reputational, slightly more sort of touchy-feely, amorphous kind of stuff. And so what the court says is, frankly, uh, yes to the plaintiff. These are all contested matters that ought to be properly determined by the expert pursuant to the share purchase deed. And clauses 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3 ought to be considered by the expert in relation to the determination of the value of earnings. We got a bit fiddly. I hope that discussion of a certain share purchase deed assisted you, and I look forward to joining you again soon over another coffee and in respect of another case note. Cheers.